Good morning. Thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for being on time. And thanks for being here instead of at the digitalization session down the hall because it seems uh, that's generated a, a lot of interest. But I, I do think it's important also to, to sit and talk about public policy even if it's, uh, it's not the, the sexiest subject. Um, <clears throat> my name is Paul Voss. I'm the Managing Director of Eurohead and Power. Um, I'm going to guide you through the session today, but I'm going to try and keep my mouth shut as much as I can so that we can take advantage of the, the panelists that we have and also um, you guys here in the room. Listen, I'm counting on you. I want some questions. So first of all, there's this uh, tool called Slido, so slido.com. Uh, and if you use, it will ask you for a kind of hashtag. And if you use EHP policy, then you'll be allowed to submit questions, uh, which can be read out. You can make them anonymous or not, depending on how you feel. But the important thing is I'd like you to try and use this tool, please. Just get your phones out so you can ask these questions. I think it'll make for a much, much richer discussion. We are going to talk this morning about delivering the energy union. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it yet, the energy union is this kind of overarching conceptual framework that the European Commission published initially in 2015. And as far as I can understand it, its overall purpose is to sort of guide the EU in the next 10, 12 years of its energy policy so that we start to move towards the medium term targets for 2030 for the continuation of the energy transition and also setting us on a proper pathway, a proper trajectory to 2050. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. In my business, we love stuff like this. We love legislation. We love proposals because it's oxygen for a lobby organization like ours. It gives us activity. It gives us purpose. It gives us excitement. So we, we like these things. But I have had the impression that uh, not everyone felt the same way. If I, if I look back, the Commission began preparing this package, which it finally published in November of 2016. I don't know, 18 months before that. So there was this long period where we were waiting for this package. And every time I heard people talk about it, I heard it described using natural disaster metaphors. So we were going to have a legislative tsunami or a legislative avalanche or a volcano. Or my personal favorite, and I don't mind telling you this came from a representative of the Danish government, the Death Star. So they published this Death Star in November 2016. It comes up to something like four and a half thousand pages when you stack it all together. I think I've kind of read most of it. I'm sure someone in our organization has read all of it by now. Um, we think there's a lot to like about it. You know, it is, I think, too often the case that people begin from a position of, of skepticism and, and, and almost fear when there's new regulatory activity. Um, we think there's a lot to like about this. Of course, we have our concerns and we have points to make, but I think it's more a question of tweaking the detail but embracing the, the, the overall spirit uh, because I think that this thing is, I mean, we need a framework. We need legislation. And, uh, and I think that uh, this can be not a barrier for us, but really a driver for the development of this industry. But that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, we, are <coughs> we are very fortunate to have with us, as I said, a wonderful group of panelists. We are missing one. Uh, Erica Hope from the European Climate Foundation has had a, a, a travel complication, uh, and I don't think she's going to make it this morning. But uh, we still have three excellent people up here, and like I said, we have you guys in the room. I know everyone says this before every panel, but I'd really like to try and see some genuine interaction uh, among the panelists and, 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 and with you, the audience. So, so please do have your questions in mind. Um, what we're going to do is start with a presentation from the European Commission. So we have Eva Hoss here from the Renewable Energy Unit who uh, has worked in and around uh, policy related to district heating for some time now. She is um, the archetypal hardworking Commission official. I don't mind telling you. I get emails from her doing work far later than she should be. So if anyone ever tells you that these officials in Brussels don't do anything, well, this isn't the case. Um, Eva has done an enormous amount of work uh, on subjects that greatly influence our industry in the last years. 
and we have always found her um, a reliable partner, an open mind, and, uh, and as I said, a very, a very effective official indeed. Ava's gonna talk us through this Death Star, this winter package, this clean energy package this morning in all its facets so that you get an overall picture of the, the policy architecture, and then I'm sure she will point to certain areas which are of particular importance to district heating. Uh, once she has done that, it's a kind of setting the scene job, we can then move on to a discussion and a debate around that theme and uh, talk about how we as an industry see it and how you and your organizations uh, see it and what we can do to make it even better. So with that, I'd like you to kindly welcome to the stage Eva Hoss. Thank you, Paul, and uh, indeed, this is a tsunami when it comes to have to, somebody have to present it for, uh, for an audience because it's really a quite giant package uh, that I will uh, go through with you uh, this morning to give an overall context of um, uh, the Energy Union framework and the clean energy for all uh, package that is uh, one of the key uh, delivery of the energy union uh, strategic framework. Um, perhaps, okay, I have to go to this. Yeah. So let's start with the energy union, um, which basically. Uh, um, is the starting point, we can say. Uh, it provides an overarching strategic umbrella framework and the governance framework uh, setting the overarching goals for the European Union energy policy and also provides uh, for actions, uh, for a program and for a governance uh, framework to deliver uh, these uh, policy objectives um, uh, of the European Union. And the key uh, purpose uh, is really to first implement the 2020 uh, energy and climate framework, to, and then to ensure that the 2030 energy and climate framework is uh, properly implemented. And this is done in a way that prepares the, the union towards a longer term uh, objective, which is uh, uh, summarized in the uh, two 2015 uh, Paris Agreement uh, for which uh, the European Union and its member states are members. Um, so the goal is to deliver the 2020 targets, the 2030 targets, and build an energy system uh, that is uh, 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 that is uh, really uh, up to the challenge that we face on the long term in EU and uh, global energy uh, issues. The main goal of the energy uh, union is to deliver a resilient energy union with a forward-looking climate policy that should give secure, sustainable, competitive and affordable energy uh, to all households and businesses um, uh, in, in the EU. And for achieving this, uh, keeping in mind that the 2050, 2015 Paris Agreement committed uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, by 80, 85, 90% uh, towards pre-industrial levels, um, this basically the strategy uh, tells, um, sets out the need to uh, bring a fundamental transformation of the European energy system uh, to build a low carbon economy and to build an energy sector which is basically carbon free and carbon neutral. Uh, for doing this, uh, the energy union uh, would like to focus on five key dimensions, energy security, uh, uh, solidarity and trust, a fully integrated internal energy market. Uh, it would like to uh, ensure that energy efficiency 
uh, becomes a fuel on its own right, a source of energy on its own right. So energy efficiency first principle is set out in the energy union. Uh, there is a goal to help transition the European economy to a low carbon society and uh, in doing so ensure competitiveness uh, of the European economy and industry and uh, keep and increase the European leadership in technology and innovation, in particular in clean energies, clean and smart energies. So this is the overarching uh, uh, objective, five guiding dimensions, and then there have been a set of 15 uh, concrete actions laid down in the strategy and 43 initiatives, and we see now with the mega package uh, that has been published on the 30th of November 2016. Uh, one of the key deliveries uh, of this program uh, has been put on table. And um, we are basically looking at the complete overhaul of the European Union energy legislative and regulatory framework. Um, uh, with this package and already before that with another uh, delivery, deliverable which was the EU heating and cooling strategy which I would like to mention here because it has a lot of uh, relevance uh, for the clean energy package that was published last November. The EU heating and cooling strategy uh, was one of the uh, new items identified for a work item for the Commission to do. And that was the first uh, policy paper uh, issued by the Commission that tackled the heating and cooling sector as such in a comprehensive, uh, holistic way. And what this strategy have done is basically set out and map the basic facts uh, uh, and issues in the heating and cooling sector. This is this strategy that uh, brought uh, together a first series of data that allowed us to see uh, how much energy uh, Europe consumes for heating and cooling, what is the composition of this uh, consumption, in which sectors, which fuels, which technologies uh, are involved, and uh, what are those gaps uh, uh, that, or barriers and obstacles that we need to overcome in order to bring the heating and cooling sector up to the challenge of a decarbonized energy system on the long run in the horizons of 2030 and, or, uh, and 2050. So this, uh, the strategy basically established the fact that around half of the EU final and prime energy consumption is consumed for heating and cooling in buildings, industry, uh, um, uh, and uh, tertiary sectors. Uh, most of this energy is produced by fossil fuels, 75%. Uh, at that time, we had a number that only 16 some percent was produced from renewable energy. Uh, the 2015 data has shown that now we have reached 18.6% renewable energy. Uh, we also established that uh, this heating and cooling sector had enormous room for energy efficiency uh, because if we looked at the main sectors where it was consumed in the building sector, uh, we see that the building uh, stock in the European Union overall is very inefficient. 75% of the buildings uh, have been built before uh, really any serious energy performance requirements were in place uh, and there are easily uh, potential to reduce uh, the heat consumption in the building stock overall by 50% and if we go to deep renovations uh, even further. But of course this is a cost issue but even with available technologies today and with simple renovation techniques we can achieve enormous amount of energy savings. Um, so basically low uh, renewable penetration, uh, enormous amount of inefficiencies in the heating and sector, not only in the building side, but also in the industrial side. Uh, and uh, we I managed to identify that, for example, uh, the waste 
wasted energy, the so-called residual or surplus energy that comes as a result of industrial processes, power generation, uh, service sector activities such as um, uh, data centers or even infrastructure operations such as metro uh, and uh, waste uh, recycling operations produce enormous amount of heat that is go unused and that can be channeled easily uh, to heating uh, buildings and cooling buildings uh, uh, and uh, for basically uh, the entire EU building stock could be uh, heated by this uh, waste energy. Uh, of course, uh, that's a technical potential, so in, in practice it's much less, but even if only a fraction of this wasted energy is used, we can save enormous amount of primary energy that now today we generate new. The strategy also identified a number of key synergies, uh, and these are important because you will see these syn synergies being reflected in the clean energy package that then um, were published um, later uh, uh, um, a year after this uh, heating and cooling strategy was produced. And the key, first uh, key synergy is that energy savings and the deployment of sustainable uh, energy supply should go hand in hand. In simple terms, when uh, we um, look at, for example, buildings uh, decarbonization, there are two ways of doing that, uh, two key ways. One is to uh, energy, increase energy efficiency, and the second is to increase renewable energy or other low carbon sources of supply. Uh, but it makes sense to reduce the energy consumption, uh, to the demand to a level that is strictly necessary based on the available uh, energy efficiency technologies and uh, solutions that we have today, and uh, only supply the remaining uh, uh, need, demand, energy need of a building or an industrial process from uh, renewable energies. So energy efficiency and renewable energy, sustainable energy should go hand in hand. Uh, the second synergy, and th because this leads to cost reduction, uh, this leads to much less capacity, needs to invest in capacity, uh, reduces uh, the need to build infrastructure, reduces the need to uh, uh, secure energy resources, and even renewable resources are scarce resources to, to a certain extent. So we need to uh, really use all energy resources, even renewable resources, with the maximum efficiency in the spirit of uh, resource efficiency that also the Union have a strat has a strategy which is issued um, uh, recently on resource efficiency and waste energy, for example. The second uh, synergy was that we, uh, it is a good idea to link uh, the heating sector and the heating and cooling sector with the electricity sector because this would help both sectors to decarbonize. Um, uh, the electricity system, uh, the, the today there are two big uh, renewable electricity sources. This is wind and solar. Both of these sources are variable sources. That means that um, they are not dispatchable. Uh, their production depends on weather patterns and uh, um, they are not that easy to program. Uh, they produced when these resources are available and um, uh, they require flexibility uh, for, from the electric systems because um, there is a need to balance the electric system supply and demand should at each point of time be in balance. And therefore, when we increase the amount of uh, variable electricity in the system, there is a need to increase the flexibility through storage, balancing mechanism, and uh, making the demand also flexi more flexible. So not just the supply is variable, uh, but the demand should become also variable or flexible. So this match between demand and supply and each point of time can take place. So uh, the conclusion is that when the electricity, renewable, uh, variable electricity uh, proportion in a system 
uh, grows to a certain threshold, then we need basically overhaul the entire electricity system, the grid, how the grid is working, how the grid is managed. We need to uh, overhaul the generation technologies, bring new technologies to increase flexibility, such as new balancing um, arrangement, storage technologies, uh, demand response uh, solutions. Um, and uh, the heating and cooling sector can be one of those flexibility sources and a cheap one, because, for example, uh, heating takes an enormous amount of energy. As I said, it's 50% much bigger than electricity, by the way. So channeling some of the electricity, surplus electricity, to heating and cooling uh, demand or to store for uh, thermal storage tanks makes a lot of sense. So the heating sector can provide flexibility, can help balancing the electric system. And on the other hand, that also means that uh, the renewable part of the heating and cooling would increase. So both sectors help each other out very nicely in this decarbonization path and going towards uh, more renewables, uh, basically a, a renewable dominated energy system. And the third uh, linkage that I already mentioned was that we uh, must use uh, the enormous amount of surplus heat that um, is resulting inevitably uh, from uh, industrial processes and also power generation. And uh, um, we, of course, need to make industrial processes and power generation processes as efficient as possible. And there is a continuous uh, uh, technology evolution in this uh, respect. But there are some thermodynamic limits, lim limits and uh, uh, that is almost inevitable that we will have some waste energy and we can use this very <coughs> uh, easily in uh, through district heating and cooling system to build the big uh, stocks of European building stocks. Uh, and there have been many uh, tools and solutions that the strategy identified, but I would just uh, highlight, of course, district heating and district cooling was singled out as one of the possible instruments that can help that could be a building block of a decarbonized, modern, uh, uh, low-carbon energy system. So the 21st century energy solution, one of those um, can be district energy, uh, heat, and cool cold networks. And of course, uh, there were many other uh, uh, areas that uh, we identified Cooling was identified as a growing, um, have a, having a growing importance. Thermal storage uh, that needs to be developed, energy storage, smart buildings, uh, demand response, and um, uh, the strengthening of self-consumption capabilities of consumers so they can produce <coughs> uh, their own energy, uh, feed surplus energy into the common grid. Uh, participate in demand response and store energy, so become an active player in the energy system that would increase flexibility overall. Waste, heat, waste, cold, and we also said that integrated planning and mapping of the energy system makes a lot of sense because it identifies synergies and cost reduction possibilities. So district heating here, here is, uh, was identified as an important element and I don't want to de dwell on it, but uh, uh, we see that district heating today, if we look at the reality, is uh, not up to this uh, vision that we can uh, assign to the district systems uh, becoming a part of a decarbonized, low carbon, highly efficient energy system, especially in urban areas. That's a vision that some district uh, systems today uh, fulfill and uh, show uh, exciting uh, solutions uh, in many respects. Many type of new technologies are brought in, renewables, energy efficiency, smartness, smart algorithms, uh, participation and collaboration with the electricity grid to provide balancing, to provide storage and so on. However, if we look at the mass of the 
uh, industry, we see that this is still a tiny fraction and there is room to move the, 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 the sector towards this vision to become a building block of the future energy system. So coming to now the clean uh, energy for all package, uh, basically uh, it delivers on the energy union strategic framework. So if you read the strategy, uh, for example, the strategy identifies that we need to support investment in renewable energy. We need to make consumers the center of our energy, uh, providing a good deal for them and uh, uh, ensuring that they own the energy transition. We need to decentralize the system, transform, make the electricity system fit for purpose uh, for integrating much more renewables. Uh, and so on. Many uh, key uh, objectives have been identified there and then for the heating and cooling sector uh, was uh, in the heating and cooling strategy. And if we look at this mega legislative package, we see that all these principles have been taken on board and uh, we see in various parts of the legislation uh, uh, elaborating and making operational those principles in various pieces of legislation. So uh, still the package keeps the five dimensions uh, quite uh, uh, as a guiding uh, uh, principle. Energy efficiency must be first. Energy security is enormously important. Um, we need to integrate the energy markets within the EU to make them uh, cooperate much better, uh, decarbonizing the economy, uh, making renewable energy uh, 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 in the European Union be becoming number one in renewable energy and strengthening research, innovation and competitiveness through uh, uh, tools that will help Europe uh, keep leadership in these technologies. So these are the overarching principles and uh, uh, there have been eight legislative proposals uh, to deliver uh, on, on this. Um, the key blocks are uh, a new governance framework which is uh, embodied in a energy union governance regulation. Uh, there are two uh, legislative uh, pieces uh, that uh, for energy efficiency that have been reviewed, the Energy Efficiency Directive and the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. There is a new Renewable Energy Directive and the electricity market design have been completely overhauled. Uh, this impacted um, um, many uh, di directives, the Electricity Directive Regulation, uh, I think five uh, uh, pieces of legislation have been uh, reviewed, revised uh, for the electricity market design and also for the solidarity uh, executive supply perspective. Now, what are the, the key objectives? Um, for the energy efficiency and renewable uh, uh, review, the key objective is really uh, to adapt these uh, directives to the 2030 framework in a way that they also pave the way for a long-term transformation for more renewable energy and for more energy efficiency. So therefore to deliver the EU targets on energy efficiency, renewable energy, but also to put in place the structure, the market structure, the regulatory framework that allow uh, the European Union and its member states to go then continue further towards the 2050 time horizon and to also deliver uh, on the EU commitment under the 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And the electricity market design have been reviewed uh, because um, it really needs to integrate, enable much more renewable energy and energy efficiency. If we look at the energy efficiency framework, uh, uh, basically what uh, is the, the key elements are that the the target has been, a new target for 2030 has been proposed. Um, 
the starting point uh, was the 2014 Council conclusions that set for the uh, EU 27% uh, at least 27% uh, renewable uh, energy target and um, at least 27% energy efficiency target with a view uh, uh, keeping in mind a 30% target that should be um, the target should be rev reviewed in uh, keeping this 30% possibility in mind by 2020. And in 2014, uh, the Commission already reviewed the energy efficiency target and concluded that the proper uh, energy efficiency target would be 30% instead of 27% because it has a lot of uh, uh, multiple benefits that it can deliver for society in terms of lower energy prices, security of supply, uh, jobs and growth, uh, investment, environmental benefits, and uh, security of supply, for example, uh, uh, increased savings mean uh, considerable reduction in uh, fossil fuel imports into the European Union. It was shown in this uh, review in 2014 that one percentage point of uh, energy savings can lead to 2.6 percent reduction in natural gas import to the European Union. So the proposal have uh, um, put a 30% target as opposed to the 27% uh, that was mainly recommended by the Council. And uh, for this, uh, but anyway, for the 2000 targets, uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive, which sets the 20, 2020 target, had to be reviewed. Um, uh, and uh, also the energy savings mechanism uh, that has been uh, enshrined in this directive, uh, namely the energy efficiency obligation schemes, have to be, had to be adapted to the 2030 framework. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, there has been also a review to, to the article that today uh, prescribes member states to the requirement to save every year 1.5 percent of final energy use uh, in the period between 2014 and 2020. And this one percentage point uh, yearly saving requirement uh, has been uh, prolonged now uh, to 2030. So the new directive introduces a new uh, an article, an amendment to this article requiring that in 2020 and 2030 there should be this one point 5% uh, yearly saving each year, with the possibility, by the way, to prolong it even further based on a review. Um, so, so updating the target to 2030, um, prolonging the energy saving mechanism until 2030 and possibly beyond are the key elements of the Energy Efficiency Directive review. And then uh, there are also a number of uh, elements uh, on billing and metering uh, to deliver on the energy consumer focus. Uh, the thermal energy billing and metering provisions have been clarified. The electricity uh, billing and uh, metering provisions have been brought to the electricity market package. So the energy efficiency directive is now focuses on basically thermal uh, energy metering and billing, which is district heating and cooling and central heating and cooling. Um, there, ha there has been requirements uh, how clear the consumer information should be and that remotely readable meters should be introduced in uh, uh, the heating and cooling metering. If we look at the energy performance of buildings directive, uh, uh, there was an obligation in this directive to review it uh, until the end of 2016, I, uh, 2016 uh, 1st of January 2017. Uh, the review uh, process that the um, Commission has been conducted through two, uh, two years has shown that um, uh, there is a lot to do to uh, facilitate building renovations uh, because uh, the existing building stock is basically the bulk of the EU building stock. There is a very low renovation rate. 
uh, around one percentage point. There is a very low new build rate, around one percentage point. And therefore, that means that the buildings that are uh, old already will probably, the most buildings, two-thirds of the buildings that we have today will stay with us in 2015 and be, will be standing and used. Therefore, there needs to be a focus not only on new buildings, but also on the renovation of existing buildings. For that, uh, there is a need to uh, uh, overhaul the financing framework. Uh, that the European Union can provide the funds uh, and the way public money, EU and national uh, member states money can be used and to ensure that this funding goes to even for small projects for residential uh, consumers and um, there is a big leverage effect so the uh, private money can bring, uh, come in and uh, uh, um, uh, see the renovation sector as uh, attractive in terms of uh, uh, financial terms. So there is a financing framework element that need to be needed to be tackled and uh, we are working on that in, in under various pro uh, work streams. And then uh, there was this uh, conclusion that digitalization of the buildings and smartening of all electric energy systems is uh, have enormous potential and basically an imperative to prepare the 21st century energy systems uh, that must be much more uh, flexible, much more responsive, and this would bring uh, savings and this would also help consumers to become much more active, empower them, and make them an active participants of their own uh, energy production, consumption, and energy uh, activities. So there has been the Energy Performance of Building Directive review. I will not go into the details. It also proposes a number of uh, uh, administrative simplification and, um, on the, uh, and it also has now proposals that link uh, the uh, public money financing for building uh, renovation with performance indicators to ensure that if uh, public money is given then the renovation should be done to a very good standard and uh, uh, possibly to be a deep renovation. And there has been a number of uh, articles on that, uh, for example, to help uh, aggregation of small projects uh, that would help uh, banks and big financial institutions to come in and provide funding because they generally, the transaction cost itself uh, for small project is so large that otherwise they would not come in and uh, provide money and th they're risking facilities to, re in, uh, to make the cost of capital much more affordable for all uh, investors, for all uh, developers and project uh, managers. If we look at the new electricity market design, uh, I, as I mentioned, this uh, consists of the review of many uh, pieces of legislation, most importantly, perhaps electricity uh, regulation and the directive, the regulation on the uh, uh, agency uh, for the energy uh, electricity market and energy market and the risk preparedness regulation. But what are the key principles here? Uh, so uh, the electricity market has been basically keeping an old structure, big centralized production, uh, um, demand is inflexible and passive, uh, supply uh, is done by big centralized plants and uh, the grid itself is mostly passive too. Uh, now, that old type of uh, uh, centralized um, uh, structure uh, based on fossil fuels and the characteristics of fossil fuels it, uh, is no more uh, compatible with an increased renewable electricity production. In 2030, we are looking at the need to have 50% of electricity covered by uh, renewable uh, sources, mainly wind and solar. Um, and in 2050, electricity should be basically carbon free. Um, this requires more decentralization, 
uh, a more dynamic electricity system, supply and demand should be more flexible, and uh, the old infrastructure needs to be uh, renewed, uh, especially not only at the transmission level, but also with the decentralized system, it comes the necessity to also modernize the distribution network, which are currently quite uh, obsolete and uh, lacking a lot of investment. So this all means enormous amount of investment that the uh, Commission identified would be a one trillion uh, euro investment, um, uh, uh, at least, um, that somehow needs to be mobilized and the market framework should be such that investors are actually willing to come in. So uh, the uh, key uh, principles are to uh, boost uh, wholesale market flexibility, uh, provide clear price signals uh, for renewable energy and for investment in renewable energy, enabling active consumers, uh, and through demand response, storage, self-consumption, and promote regional cooperation and generally the European dimension over overall the entire energy market system. Here are the key building blocks. Uh, it's a tremendously complex uh, legislative package in itself, uh, in addition to energy efficiency and renewable energy, which are also quite complex. But uh, on, uh, it tackles the wholesale market to ensure flexibility, uh, to increase liquid, liquidity. So there is a development and coupling of uh, uh, various um, uh, intraday and day ahead market and balancing markets uh, needs to be uh, adjusted and reformed. Um, and uh, the subsidy and price signals uh, strengthened so therefore, uh, for example, dispatch rules for renewables and for others have been reviewed to ensure that the market price really is the one that drives investment. Uh, it also contains uh, provisions on capacity markets that should uh, set principles how sh capacity markets should be developed and what uh, are the principles that ensures that they uh, do not foreclose national markets, but um, remain open and uh, uh, and also uh, have correct price signals. Um, the fair deal for consumers means that uh, the retail market uh, system has been completely overhauled. Uh, the information provision for consumers, for example, the information uh, through smart meters, the information through billing. The billing information has been standardized uh, pro, uh, uh, to make it clear and understandable. Uh, there are rules on energy communities, there are rules on energy storage and uh, consumer rights to participate in balancing and demand response. Um, and there, there are provisions on how to increase regional cooperation uh, between uh, transmission system operators, distribution system operators, energy regulators, and uh, providing a common analysis on capacity and grid uh, development. Um, on just the wholesale market for electricity, um, um, yes, I think I covered this already, but all this um, overhaul really is uh, done in keeping the increase renewable uh, generation in mind and to allow and make the electricity market fit for deploying renewables at a much larger scale uh, uh, until 2030, as I said, at least 50% and even more uh, by 2015. Um, and then on, I just would like to uh, uh, highlight that the demand response uh, provisions that have been until now in the energy efficiency directive has been transferred to the electricity market design uh, legislation and uh, has been quite uh, amply developed. Um, if we go to renewable energy, again, the, uh, the objective here is to enshrine the 2030 uh, renewable target into a new legislation, piece of legislation, and update the entire legislation uh, to this new time horizon. Uh, 
uh, there is um, basically a requirement that the 2020 targets member states should reach them in 2020 and these targets should be a baseline. Uh, there is a penalty for member states if they fall behind the 2020 renewable levels that has been put in the uh, direct, uh, proposed directive. And then from these 2020 levels, there is a need to move towards uh, the 2030 target. There is a big difference with the current framework, which is based on national renewable targets. Uh, in the new framework, there is no national renewable target, but there is a common collective EU target, and member states should uh, contribute to reach these uh, targets. And there is an entire governance process that ensures uh, that uh, this contribution is uh, uh, sufficient to reach the, uh, the EU target and member states actually deliver on their contribution to reach the EU target. And this governance framework is uh, contained in the new governance regulation together with the governance framework for the energy efficiency directive that also have this EU common EU target uh, without national targets that needs to be managed uh, at union level in a collaborative, cooperative dialogue process, which is a iterative process uh, looking at what member states are willing to uh, do, what their ambitions are, contributions are, what the measures they are willing to take, and a continuous process to assess whether this is sufficient. So this is uh, how the uh, EU renewable delivery mechanism looks like. So there are so-called gap fillers, uh, and um, uh, in case there is not enough uh, uh, contribution, uh, so it's quite uh, complex. But if we look at the new renewable energy directive, uh, we have see we see updated objectives, the new targets. Uh, we see a big block on electricity, a big block on uh, heating and cooling, on transport. There is a new uh, section on bioenergy sustainability. And uh, there are, uh, this is a recast of the directive, so uh, we also kept uh, a number of uh, provisions but updated and modernized them, such as the target calculations and the joint project mechanism. And, um, uh, for example, the consumer provisions and uh, guarantees of origin, uh, we kept uh, some of these and uh, modernized uh, some elements of these already existing provisions on administrative procedures, for example, and training. So, first big, big block, electricity, uh, how to ensure that uh, the EU is going to be able to increase this process, so there is a target, but in the, uh, which is uh, going to be delivered through the governance framework and the directive, uh, renewable energy directive, such as also the energy efficiency directive, provides measures for member states and instruments to do that. And here are the uh, electricity uh, measures, uh, an update on the support schemes, again to ensure that there is price flexibility, uh, price uh, signals, proper price signals, so support schemes need to be market-based and market-reflexive, and administrative barriers need to be uh, reduced. Uh, we proposed one-stop shops, time limits for authorization and permits, um, a very big um, uh, simplification for small consumers, uh, for example, simple notification uh, for small-scale production and repowering of wind power plants. There is a big uh, uh, block on consumer engagement. Um, uh, we promote renewable self-consumers and self-consumptions and energy communities. And energy communities are also part of the electricity directive. Uh, I have to say that these uh, pieces of legislation are interlinked and have a lot of links and synergies and cross-references with each other, so the negotiation process is not very easy for the Council and the Parliament and for the Commission because 
uh, any change in one part of the uh, package can have impact to somewhere, somewhere else. So they all need to be looked together and conducted in parallel. That's what we do in the Council and also the Parliament. Uh, if we come to renewable heating and cooling, uh, already the energy, uh, heating and cooling strategy stated the importance of this sector, that this is too big to be ignored and too big for not being active in this sector because without the heating and cooling sector, we will simply not be able to deliver the decarbonization objectives. We will not be able to go to the uh, uh, end point of the Paris Agreement in 2050. So there is a need to be active and finally tackle the heating and cooling sector specifically uh, in each member states and at union level. Um, here we are today, 18.6%, um, uh, that's the latest data for 2015. I should point out that most of the heating is today provided by biomass. It's around uh, almost 90%, 84% uh, actually, or, or I think it's, uh, something like 80%. Uh, we have heat pumps uh, and other big uh, chunk, it's uh, much slow, uh, lower, but still the second largest uh, way behind biomass, which is around 9%, and the rest is really insignificant uh, in terms of renewable heat solution. Um, so how to tackle the heating sector? It's very difficult because it's diverse and very local. Um, so it's very uh, not easy to find common rules and common, common uh, instrument that can be applied at EU level. Uh, the objective was to mainstream renewables in heating and cooling, opening up uh, heating, create and open up local heating and cooling markets uh, for renewable energy and ensure that renewable cooling is integrated the supply fully into the demand and the end use sectors such as building and industry and the infrastructures are developed accordingly. We have two new articles, brand new articles, article 23 on uh, this requires that member states increase each year by one percentage point the share of renewable energy in heating and cooling. And the second brand new article is on district heating and cooling which requires uh, consumer information on energy performance, uh, consumer disconnection and switching rights, access uh, to the network only for renewable and waste heat producers with a uh, lot of uh, exemptions and uh, uh, possibilities uh, to uh, deviate from that. And, um, and also a requirement to put in place a, a framework uh, EU level and then uh, framework uh, for uh, regulating these uh, infrastructure pieces. Transport, uh, uh, the Commission has uh, published the low, uh, mob low carbon mobility strategy and um, uh, the renewable energy directive delivers some on, of this. The key uh, idea is to uh, really boost uh, research and innovation in uh, so-called advanced biofuels and also to bring electrification uh, to electri renewable electricity to transport. So these are the two focuses and this is where the EU uh, is willing to provide enormous amount of support in also in terms of research money and public uh, funds. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the so-called conventional biofuels that are based on food crops, uh, they uh, are going to be limited uh, progressively uh, to reduce to 3.8% by, um, uh, by 2000, uh, 2030 um, um, because it has a um, risk of impacting the food supply and the sustainability because uh, biomass is so important for both heating and cooling and heating mainly and also transport, there has been a need to upgrade the sustainability framework. Uh, the current directive contains uh, sustainability criteria for biofuels um, and um, 
uh, bioliquids, but not for biomass uh, and biomass-based uh, fuels. Um, so this has been uh, a new uh, proposal on this. Uh, for forest biomass, uh, we apply a so-called risk-based approach, uh, which is, requires that member states should have in place a proper framework for sustainability of biomass. Uh, the greenhouse gas saving requirements have been uh, uh, strengthened, and um, there is a cogeneration requirement for large-scale biomass use for heating. Uh, or electricity, this should be always cogeneration when biomass is used for large-scale electricity production. Um, so the governance framework uh, is the crown on this uh, many sectoral legislation. It basically ensures a single uh, uh, mechanism to um, um, make member states uh, do strategic planning uh, to uh, planning of objectives and measures and to ensure that they deliver on those objectives and measures and the Commission uh, can monitor progress and it also provides a dialogue framework, an iterative process, a dialogue between Member States and the Commission and the Member States themselves through the strengthened regional cooperation uh, requirements. So this is a single legislative act uh, that is an umbrella for the energy efficiency, renewable energy, uh, the electricity market, and also the other, uh, the all five dimension of the energy union. So the, the progress of member states should be um, uh, implemented and measured and monitored under this governance framework for all five dimensions. It is based on uh, integrated national energy and climate plans uh, that are up, need to be updated every five years. Uh, there is a bian uh, two, uh, biennial comprehensive progress report uh, and some limited assessment uh, every second years. Annual monitoring report, which are part of the energy union, uh, union address or uh, energy union reporting framework. Um, there is a mechanism to look at the ambition levels and the deliverable member states, and the Commission has means to provide recommendations and to propose EU uh, uh, level measures or even national measures if there is insufficient progress or insufficient ambition. Um, so these are uh, um, uh, put in this reg uh, regulation. Uh, with uh, quite uh, detailed deadlines. The first national plans, draft national plans should be, we proposed already uh, notified 1st of January 2018, next year's probably this not, is not going to be happen that way, but uh, this is a negotiation process, so, uh, but the framework is there as we proposed. So there are many interlinkages, as I said, it monitors renewable energy directive, energy efficiency directive, market design initi initiative, the effort sharing regulation, because the energy and climate uh, 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 policies have been also combined under the governance framework. The land use uh, reporting obligations have been streamlined. Uh, there has been many uh, separate reporting that are now subsumed under these uh, national energy and climate plans and progress reports such as the Re National Renewable Energy Action Plan, Climate Action Plan, National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, and uh, the three other uh, dimensions have been also integrated into the governance reporting and planning framework. It has been synchronized with the reporting obligation under the UN uh, framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, so on greenhouse gas emission monitoring and uh, uh, reporting. This is the timetable that we have proposed and again a summary of how it looks like, uh, how it encompasses everything. So within this framework we find um, of course uh, the district uh, energy uh, sector uh, which has, is, has a lot of um, 
it is going to be impacted by many elements of this package on electricity market design because it will define uh, whether district networks can participate in balancing, provide storage uh, and uh, system service uh, services for the electricity grid. So it's going to be impacted by, of course, the Renewable Energy Directive quite significantly uh, on the energy performance of buildings directive through the uh, how to calculate the performance of buildings and what um, how uh, the district perform district energy performance can be an input to the building performance uh, financing uh, and um, many other aspects is uh, is really going to provide for example the the, the right of consumers for information, for billing and metering, the right of consumers to form energy communities. All this is going to impact directly or indirectly uh, the district energy sector and of course uh, the two articles that directly relate to district uh, heating and cooling is in the energy uh, renewable and directive. Uh, if we look at the um, uh, negotiation process. We have started um, uh, the negotiations in the Council are quite advanced, uh, especially on the energy efficiency file. Uh, it is expected that by June there will be a common political agreement on how to go forward with the energy efficiency package. The Renewable Energy Directive, we started to discuss this in the Council. Uh, we presented already the electricity, the heating and cooling, uh, uh, the consumers, energy communities, uh, provisions and the transport and the biosustainability block is going to come soon. Um, um, the market design, electricity market design goes a bit slower, but, uh, uh, also, uh, but there is an aim to, by June and September, have common uh, council agreements or positions on these. At the same time, the Parliament has been also uh, agreed how to allocate within uh, the different uh, political groups and parties um, the p different species of legislation and they have also started to work quite intensively already on energy efficiency and renewable energy. And uh, again, by June, probably they will have something on renewable energy and in September some uh, common framework on the entire package. The, ideally, the goal would be to complete the negotiation this year, but this is very, very ambitious, so we will see what happens. And that's, I, I'm sure that there will be many, many amendments to all of these pieces of legislation. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you, Eva. Thanks very much. Uh, I saw people frantically taking pictures of the slides. Uh, it's okay. We'll, we'll make sure that, uh, that they're available afterwards as long as that's, that's okay for you, Eva. I think so, yeah? Okay. So uh, you'll, you'll be able to download them from, uh, from our website. Good. Uh, okay. We have some, some time for discussion now. And the first thing I'd like to do is introduce um, the two panelists you haven't yet heard from yet. So to my immediate right is John Dulac from the International Energy Agency. Some of you may have seen John expertly managing a panel yesterday afternoon. John is uh, an engineer and an urban planner uh, by training, and somehow that doesn't seem to stop him being an excellent communicator as well. So um, it's really nice to have John here with us. Uh, and we also have uh, Murat Isikveren from Veolia. So Murat is Director for Strategy and Innovation in the Marketing and Development Department of Veolia, uh, and has done a lot of thinking about the long-term future of district heating uh, and how it is going to evolve in order to fit in with the changing European energy picture. So what I'd like to do is uh, start asking questions and if it's okay with you guys, I'll, I'll kind of kick us off, but then I am going to expect questions from the floor. But John, to put it very simply, um, in, a, in, a, in a minute or two, what, what do you think of, of what the Commission's doing? What do you like? What do you, what do you hate? No, I think, um, as you mentioned, Paul and Eva, 4,000 pages is a lot to digest. Um, I think overall our impression at the IEA is that this is really a very positive direction forward um, for energy legislation in the EU. 
Um, I think with all EU legislation, the next step to be seen, of course, is how member states adopt this um, and how they actually interpret this with respect to the ambitions and the objectives um, and the different requirements on, on issues like reporting and performance standards and um, energy security, energy adaptability, affordability, et cetera. Um, I think with respect to our discussions today on heat and cooling, which is, um, Ava rightly mentioned, are the elephant in the room for the European Union, um, I see a lot of positives here, but also a lot of ifs um, with respect to the current um, proposals. Um, now, I think starting on the positive, that this is a really important step forward for the market, um, particularly identifying that this is an elephant and that there's a lot that can be done with it. In our analysis at the IEA, we've continue to point out that heating and cooling are a real area um, for improvements, not only from a technical perspective, but also with regards to what we define um, as the four E's at the IEA. So looking at energy security, looking at energy affordability, economic development, environmental awareness. Um, and I think if we take from a technical perspective what can be done with heating and cooling, this becomes perhaps all the more important, um, as, as you are all aware, um, it's not just about energy efficiency and improving heating demand in buildings, for example. It's also looking at a sector, as Ava pointed out in her presentation, that is diversifying, that is becoming more decentralized, that is looking increasingly at issues like electrification of transport, changing industrial demand, the need to shift, particularly with respect to the Paris Agreement, away from fossil fuels, um, and that heating and cooling offers a real opportunity with respect to balancing that system um, of the future. Um, whether it be through reducing, for example, electricity and um, heat demand through energy efficiency measures that would support, for example, additional electrification of other end uses, or whether it be storing energy, as Eva pointed out with some of the renewables directives, since thermal energy storage is the most cost-effective and well-known um, energy affordable and cost-effective uh, measure, um, whether it be through hot water tanks in residential buildings or through thermal storage or through district energy networks, um, and that, moreover, it also is one that is quite flexible, as you know, um, particularly when talking about smart and modern district energy systems, um, where using thermal inertia, in fact, could be a real game changer with respect to meeting the different objectives for energy efficiency, energy affordability, renewables, um, by displacing demands that in other sectors may not be possible. Um, so in that respect, I think this is really positive news, and I think it's particularly positive news with respect to all of you here today and, and forward thinking um, in how we can provide better solutions that are cost effective um, and energy secure and environmentally friendly. Now, at the same time, I said, and I don't see this necessarily as a negative, but as the next step to come, is how do states actually adopt this? Um, we currently see in existing legislation that there are a lot of conflicts um, that are not necessarily disadvantages, but are areas for improvement. Um, if we look, for example, at a lot of the work that's been made on buildings construction for new construction in recent years, what we see is really, really positive work on low energy building construction, but at the same time, a certain, to a certain extent with respect to energy and uh, climate, um, a contradiction in those policies where in the end, building constructors are familiar with certain products, and so they might build a very tight envelope and then install a gas boiler. And one has to ask themselves, is this really the long-term objective for the market? Um, the problem is, is that we don't really see necessarily a floor for these types of technology choices. Where typically speaking, at least within our policy recommendations at the IEA, we usually talk about push and pull policies. And I think the objective set out here and much of the work that's been done in recent years with the different energy efficiency and renewables directives have pulled the market forward but at the same time, we haven't necessarily pushed the market up. Um, and in the end, consumers and uh, installers and businesses alike essentially are looking for the least, uh, for, for the most part, are looking for the least costly option. And if we are not telling them at the same time that we tell them that this is what we want, on the bottom, we're saying this is what we don't want, we will no longer accept this, then fundamentally what happens is a lot of these decisions end up going to the least costly technology or the least costly energy efficiency measure. And with respect to long-term objectives, what we find is in fact that this creates some difficulties, let's say, or some eventual long-term problems within the system. One example, again, coming back to heating and cooling is that energy efficiency measures in buildings when we're talking about low-hanging fruits are great. Um, they're time and again proven to be cost-effective measures. The problem that we consistently point out is that, in fact, deep energy renovations in buildings are not an additive 
energy efficiency gain, that if we do 10% here, it does not mean that we get to add 10% down the road. And in fact, those additional 10% if we want to achieve them become much more expensive. Um, and what we're not currently seeing is in fact those difficult measures being taken today. Um, and whether it be with respect to buildings or heating and cooling networks or power generation or even industry in Europe, these are long-term capital investments. Um, and I think there's a lot to be done. Again, very promising potential here, but there's a lot to be done to actually ensure that the investments that we make over the next five to 10 years that really become extremely critical to obtaining those 2050, 2100 objectives need to start happening now. Um, and so I think in that sense, very positive direction um, and uh, certainly a very big congratulation to Ava and the Commission for putting this package out. Um, the next step, as I said, is really seeing how member states adapting it um, and in particular making sure that that critical period of essentially now to 2030 does not become one that we look back on and say, oops, we, sh we should have tried harder. Thanks, John. Mora, um, yes. your up here uh, mm. representing Veolia, but also somehow uh, the industry, the district energy industry, uh, among other things that Veolia works on. Mm. Eva talked about um, the energy union project of putting the customer at the experience of the energy transition. Um, and I think implicit in a lot of the commission's thinking and, 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 and discussion about district energy is this question of how to make sure that customers have a good experience on, 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 on our networks. What's Veolia going to do to make sure that district energy customers have a great experience? <laughs> okay, thank you for asking me this question. <laughs> okay, F first of all, um, m maybe a few words of, uh, on Veolia. So energy, energy services is one of the three pillars of our activities, which are based on environmental services. So we design and deliver environmental services in the, f in the, s in the, sorry, in the field of waste management, water management, energy services. And within energy services, definitely district energy is, uh, is a very big portion because it represents about uh, 3, billion, uh, 3 billion euro uh, turnover, which is uh, more than 10% of the total Veolia revenue. So definitely this is, all these topics is really at the heart of the topics. And uh, first, um, I appreciated very much what was presented on the trend of, the, of this, of what Eva presented on the efficiency first, energy efficiency first, uh, impact of renewables, safety of supply, and what you just said, then coming to, to your question, Paul, more giving more information and uh, interacting more with the customer. So for, for Veolia, to be, to be precise, the, generally the, the customer is not the end user. So the end user being the, the person or the family in the department, in the building. Our, our customer is the is, you know, is the owner, or is the city, or is the, is the airport, is the, the university, because we, we also have private, you also have, you don't, you don't only have public district heating scheme, you also have private ones, so these are our customers. So first thing, what we do with our customers more and more is we give them the decision tools, we give them the tools, that means IT tools, reports, so that they can take decisions on, for their investment and for uh, optimizing their, their energy production. Now, coming to the, to the end user, to the, to, the, to, the, to the people, to the persons in the buildings, which are the really at the, um, at the end of the chain of the, of the energy supply. In this, in this case, what we, what we strongly think, and, and we go more and more towards this, is about this... Uh, energy energy performance notion um, w if you want to make a, a truly energy performing uh, supply you need to take into consideration the distribution of energy but also the demand of course and we definitely need to interlink and we we already do that so that that means to to have information coming to the people in the apartments but coming also from them from sensors that we put in departments, that we interlink with the operations of the district heating so that we can really uh, adjust and predict uh, energy consumption, load, load profiles, so that the, the consumer uh, really, at the end of the day, uh, consumes less, less energy. But it's both, I mean, it's on both sides. It's both on the supplier side, but it's, all, it's also a kind of commitment Mm. that uh, people in the apartments must, uh, mm. must take. Mm. So this is where... 
okay. what we are doing at the moment. Thanks, Murat. Okay. I'd like to get you people involved. Uh, do we have some questions out there? I think we have a, a microphone that can be brought. Now. <laughs> you have the European Commission, the International Energy Agency, and a major energy company here. Ah, there's a hand. Thank you. <laughs> if you can just introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, my name is Fiona Riddich. Um, I'm interested in the, the challenge that exists between the built environment and supplying that through making that energy efficient and then the obvious value of ro rolling out district heating. So we heard from Eva that we need to move on deep renovation of the existing building stock and that that should precede decisions on supply. So I'm wondering, is the industry then thinking of linking to energy efficiency in buildings in their planning on rolling out district heating? Who'd like to have a pop at that? I try to, I'm not sure I, <laughs> sorry. Um, there is a question maybe of, uh, I'll try to answer, uh, there is a question of uh, temporality. Um, going into renovation, uh, planning for reno deep renovations and uh, on uh, large districts uh, takes time. Uh, you need to assess everything. Um, what we think is you, you have, uh, in the and in the same time, you have uh, short-term uh, solutions which can reduce uh, energy consumptions so improve energy efficiency by, from our experience, 10 to 20 percent, uh, purely by, uh, I would say, uh, monitoring and uh, operating well the buildings. So that means b before, in, in our, it's not a question of before or after, but uh, you have immediate solutions um, where, uh, by operating a building, um, by putting the right sensors, by uh, monitoring the heat and the heating and cooling in the building and not only uh, you know uh, looking at energy consumption every every two months or every month or every year if, if you have improved the things but actually monitoring it in uh, real time or almost real time by putting some instrumentation which is really low capital in intensive you 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 find cases where you have 10 to 20 percent immediate savings on energy consumption so um, of course, it's important to, it's definitely essential to, to think about the rollout of deep renovations because this will not be enough, but um, my element of answer, I'm not sure I answer to your question, but my element of answer is, would, be, would be that. Don't, let's not forget the short-term and uh, quick wins, low-hanging fruit solutions. Thanks, Jack. No, I think, um, Fiona, to your question, that. Uh, We've, over the last several years, um, looked at the IEA at different technical solutions to meeting heating and cooling demand in buildings, um, knowing that um, while there are low-hanging fruits um, that Murat mentioned, that the long-term objectives, particularly of reducing 30 percent or more um, in terms of energy efficiency improvement in buildings, um, that these are capital intensive. Um, part of this is due to market scale. Um, where we do not currently see in Europe or in, in most countries for that matter the necessary scale to help bring down those prices. The second is that you are very much talking about relatively specific markets where it's not so easy to just have a one-shot technology that you apply to all buildings, which of course brings the cost up. Um, and then at the same time, I also think that there's a lack of confidence overall in the market, particularly for banks in terms of investing in these um, types of energy efficiency improvements. Um, we've seen a lot of really positive work in this area, for example, in the de-risking energy efficiency project um, led by the commission, the investor confidence project. But the simple reality is that we're talking about the market that is not only disaggregated, but also very diverse. And I think we are slowly coming to the conclusion, um, at least it seems within discussions in, in uh, the European Union, um, that these need to be bulked. Um, and we've seen some promising solutions coming forward, either being led by district energy companies or being led by um, governments in partners, uh, partnership, for example, with um, industry, 
uh, that are looking at essentially saying, well, if we just do one building, it's probably not cost effective. But if we do an entire block, then it becomes cost effective, both in terms of the renovation measures, but also then meeting, for example, the heating and cooling with more um, renewable and efficient solutions, whether it be heat pumps or district energy. Um, I think some of the most promising and best practice examples um, coming out of recent years, but also historically, have been cases where we've seen this kind of community energy planning. And as Ava mentioned, this is a really critical piece within the um, tsunami of legislation coming out of the, um, legis uh, excuse me, out of the commission. Um, but we're not quite there yet. I think if coming back to our panel discussion yesterday, um, for those of you who are here, this was one of the questions that I asked um, our different panelists of what is the next step for district energy companies? I think part of this is a need to go beyond waiting for the commission to provide some directive and to come forward with solutions saying that we can do this, that there are difficulties to do this, that we need the right financing to do this, that we need the right legislative framework for us to do this, but that in fact we're here and ready and willing to do this. Um, and um, I think there's a real opportunity to, to show that because unfortunately, um, well I don't say that unfortunately, the simple reality is that the markets that have been very good at promoting themselves, for example, energy efficiency and renewables, have seen themselves time and time again counted in these proposals. Um, and the district energy community, at least from a technical perspective, we continue to show in our analysis that the IEA has a real potential for meeting these long-term objectives. It needs to come forward and say, we're here and we're ready to help you do this. Eva, um, I have maybe a slightly broader question for you if it's okay, as we're, we're, we're getting towards the end of our time. You know, we're, we spend a lot of time telling the Commission what we would like. Um, I'd like to ask the, the Commission, when you look to the challenges that Europe's facing energy-wise and you look to our industry, what do you want from, from us? It, it follows, follows on nicely from, from, from what John's just said, really. What do you need the district energy community to step up and, and deliver? I, I think the, the importance is that the district energy community sees this as an opportunity and not, not a threat. And, uh, and there is tremendous opportunity and, uh, and uh, with open mind and good uh, evolving the business uh, model and business practices, uh, I think this industry can be one of the big winners. I have been recently in the heat pump industry conference and uh, I think one of the lead MEP on energy said that the heat pumps are really the, the winners. But I think uh, district energy is also as a big winner as, as heat pumps and probably they, they are actually together. But So it can be an enormously big winner. Uh, but this is not, not uh, easy because as, as a Fiona question revealed, I mean, what we, there are many actors involved and many levels of actions need to be activated. And, um, and one is, uh, I think, the, the strategic planning. So heating and cooling is, not, is going to be a long-term learning process and curve for policymakers and also for industry to learn into how to readjust to really to this 21st century vision. So there is a strategic planning element that is in place in the energy union framework the, where member states will have to coordinate their climate policies, greenhouse gas reduction, renewable energy, energy efficiency policies. So they already have to see this together, uh, ideally together with research and innovation policies and segregative supply. So they will be forced to have this holistic view that we have advocated in the heating and cooling strategy. Then going down the next level, uh, the local and regional level will have to learn into concretely planning, doing energy planning, which is uh, optimization of what resources are there, what infrastructure are there, what technologies have, what uh, is their legacy that they have to cook from, and what is uh, how best they can use it and how new, what new elements they need to bring in. And, uh, and then there is a regulatory level, for example, building regulations clearly needs to be adjusted to, uh, to promote this uh, 
uh, renovation and in the renovation plan district energy should be one of the options the same uh, uh, on the same right as a gas condensing boiler um, local um, municipalities need to update their regulation on spatial planning urban planning to properly coordinate their infrastructure deployment product regulation on uh, on technologies eco design is is also a big tool and technology regulation and innovation in the new technologies and smartness is enormously uh, also important and then there's a need to really make consumers be aware that all these solutions are there. So there are many levels of actions that need to be done together. And, and I think smart uh, managers of district heating companies that are not uh, shy away from this uh, complexity, uh, they can see very, very big opportunities play out over the next five, 10 years. Thanks, Eva. Murat, you're a smart manager from a district energy company. <laughs> Can we do that? I, I confirm anyway, I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm optimistic about this, uh, this solution, about this, after all that has been said and presented. Um, and uh, again, it's, it, we are not, uh, I think, a, a static industry. We, uh, district heating industry has already evolved over the, the past years, about the past uh, century, I would say, and it will still evolve with more flexible, more, uh, um, reliable and uh, more connected to the end user industries. That's, that's for sure. And um, we are even more convinced of that because of there is bo boosting urbanization everywhere. So really the, and what you mentioned about urban planning, we already uh, leave this with, uh, when we d discuss with, uh, with town uh, managers, with city mayors, this urban planning, uh, taking uh, energy as a, uh, as a key uh, element for urban planning. And as you said, considering all solutions, not one or the other, but looking at what is the best solution and a sustainable one in the long term is really the, the, the key thing. And uh, again, I'm, I confirm I'm really optimistic about that. And uh, what you presented also was very good because this is really what we are thinking about, uh, the, the synergy between, and this has also been said yesterday, the synergy between, in fact, the different layers of heat, cooling, electricity, and this is something which is already being done by uh, district heating operators, in fact. So we, we haven't waited for these regulations, but if these regulations help to boost these kind of things, of course, we are we welcome them. Uh, we really welcome them. So um, again, I'm rather optimistic about the, the, the trend of this uh, legis new legislation, and uh, we have to grasp it and, and make the best of it, of course, for the citizens. Thanks, Brad. John, you're optimistic? <laughs> no, I, I am. I think, um, I think across not, not only the legislation, but publicly, um, we've seen a real change in the last several years of people understand there's a need for this energy transition, as we're calling it. Um, and the steps forward certainly are complex and perhaps not so self-evident, but that I think there's a real movement here. Um, I, I, just coming back to this point about empowering the consumer, I think this is a real opportunity, um, especially for district energy companies, um, to take advantage. Um, and I, I think if we were to pull from a similar example in the transport field of what Uber did to taxis, mm -hmm. that um, there's a real lesson to be learned here that consumers do expect, as was discussed yesterday in some of the mm -hmm. panels, consumers expect to have some level of awareness. Now, to what depth do they actually want to have information? That's questionable. But they do expect as consumers to have some information about their energy services. Now, the game changer here for me with respect to district energy is, do we wait until someone comes up with an app and essentially makes us antiquated and no longer cool? Or do we actually use that as an opportunity to show ourselves as someone who's out there and willing to work with consumers? Um, as a last point that I think is probably an, a very interesting example, Paul and I actually were on a panel recently looking at renewable heat in the European Union. <coughs> Um, and there was a representative there from Frankfurt, um, and I, I really was very impressed by this, in fact, that consumers, as was mentioned yesterday, it's not just about information, but they want choice. Now, maybe in the end they don't actually get choice. Maybe the choice is still vanilla and chocolate, but they think they have choice. And, and by providing them that information, we are empowering them. And what Frankfurt has done, actually, um, the municipality itself has provided a call center, um, which I think is really quite innovative in, in the sense that I may want to be environmentally friendly or I might want packages that provide me with different choices in terms of suppliers. 
Um, but the reality is, is I probably don't know very much about the energy field. Um, and I can call this center and say to them, look, I've got an, an oil boiler or a gas boiler that I've got to replace, uh, replace. So what are some of my options? And the city will walk them through, here are some of the technical options that you can do, here are the different costs associated with it, here are some suppliers you can be in contact with. I think this kind of information, especially again, if the district energy community is to be proactive and say, we're going to provide this kind of information to consumers that you can use this to show that you are flexible, affordable, mm -hmm. you can integrate renewables, you can work with buildings. Um, so I, I would just say that seize the opportunity while it's before you. Okay. Thanks very much, John. Um, look, at, we are five minutes over time, and I don't want to keep you from your, your coffee. Um, so first of all, thank you for being here. You know, they had drones in the digital panel, so <laughs> I'm very grateful that you chose to be with us this morning. Um, and if I could ask you to please give our panelists a warm round of applause. And we will... Uh,